Welcome back to the Joe Mack Podcast. I have a very special guest. He's a personal friend of mine. We served in the military together in no other branch than the United States Marine Corps. This is Stephen Gomez, USMC, retired. Yeah. Brother, it's been a while. How you been? Oh, I've been doing good, doing good. Got released back out into the wild <laughs> and uh, trying, to, <laughs> trying to figure out how to, how to be a... Uh, Steve Gomez instead of, you know, Sergeant Gomez. Gotcha. And I don't know, with active duty for so damn long and, you know, joined the Marine Corps right out, right out of high school. And so it's pretty much the only thing I really knew. Yes. Tra- it's, it's a slow learning process, but it, it, it's a process that I'm slowly adapting and overcoming to. Fantastic. Well, I'm, I mean, I'm glad you're adapting. I'm glad you're overcoming. It's been a while since we caught up. I know that you've been out of the service since... June 2018. Uh, so mm-hmm. it's, it's been a, been about two years. And yeah, I mean, you know, the transition period is definitely different for everybody. Uh, a lot yeah. of, a lot of uh, people are going through the same um, type of transition. How's it been since 2018 up to this point? I mean, how, obviously you've made a lot of progress and, you know, you're doing great for yourself and you got the right attitude and you're willing to you know, you know, talk about it in in front of uh, obviously an audience, uh, which a lot mm-hmm. of people are not. So that really set, doesn't mean that automatically that's a testament to your character. Uh, no, just and just a couple things. I mean, when we were on active duty, I mean, you were just a top notch dude, man. You're always on top of your game, always highly motivated. You you were kind of unique to me. Seemed to be like one of them dudes that throughout your career, your motivation just increased, no matter the circumstances, no matter the odds, and. I find that that's a, a very unique uh, trait and characteristic to have, brother. Oh, thank you. It's a, it's been a massive, uh, like a drastic life change. Okay. And um, I ended up getting uh, medically retired. Okay. Which, you know, I, of course I wanted to stay in. Yeah. But, um, you know, that, that just wasn't in the cards. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I got medically retired. Um, I'm a 100% disabled veteran. And so, uh, you know, Get a nice, nice paycheck at each and every single month. Um, I'd rather be back in the green machine, but yeah, I got to deal with the cars that, I, that I'm dealt with. And uh, a lot of service members, whenever they get out, it, it's it's a massive, drastic life change where, you know, they're in charge of so many number of troops. And now they get out, they're like, yeah, no one really gives a shit. And so learning how learning that transition is, uh, it was, it was challenging. Um, but, you know, I'm making it through. One thing I never do is I never play the whole uh, woe is me card because yeah, that, that sucks. And that's how uh, that's how veterans, you know, end up getting into uh, massive drug problems, uh, severe alcohol problems and stuff like that. And you know, I'm a dad with uh, with two kids. And so uh, I don't have the luxury of doing that because I have to put them above myself at all times. And the way I look at it is the paycheck that I get. It doesn't belong to me. It belongs to my boys. I'm just... Be yeah, the steward of that to help ensure that I make all their dreams come true and make sure that they have a, a really stable environment to, to grow up in. And now um, I pretty much don't I don't have to worry about uh, employment because I'm getting like a I'm actually making more right now right now than I was when I was in the Marine Corps. And so I'm trying to use that as a positive thing because now I can spend uh, all my time with my kids, focus on them, and ensure that uh, they grow up to be the men that they're supposed to. Be. Or the, the best kind of man that I can make. Wow, wow! So medically retired, uh, not you're not playing the woe is me card, meaning that you're not uh, looking at yourself as a victim. You're looking at yourself as being in a position where you can grow and change as a human being. And it seems it sounds like you're doing that, brother. I mean, it sounds like you're you watched out for the uh, the potholes of addictions and um, other distractions mm-hmm. that can be detrimental. And, um, I mean, what do you, what do you, so obviously you attribute that to your family, but more than that, I mean, I know you as a, you know, from what I know you, uh, from the experiences that we've had together, I mean, where, where else does that come from? What else can you attribute that to? I mean, that, that type of attitude, I mean, are those, what are your big takeaways from your military service? I mean, uh... It's just the dedication on, on, on never giving up. And everyone has a, everyone goes through life's tragedies. No one's ever immune from that. Uh, one thing I really, uh, you know, 
God's got my back and he's really been helping me throughout this whole thing, you know, just focusing on his word and trying to be not only trying to be uh, a better, a better father, but a better son to my parents, a better husband to my wife, even though we're currently going through a divorce right now. Um, you know, it's just trying to, trying to deal with the, uh, the cards that I've dealt with. Um, the injuries that I have are, are pretty, are severely substantial. And so that's something I have to deal with, um, at all times. And I, uh, I tore my rotator cuff three times and I got a big massive, uh, tear behind my right scapula. And so it always feels like I've got a massive ice pick inside of my arm. And the doctors say, well, um, they really can't do much for it. And a lot of the other injuries that I have, and even went through, uh, testicular cancer, um, got corded tears on both my Achilles tendons, bilateral knee pain, bilateral hip pain, um, I freaking broke my pinky, which sucks. It, mm. Oh God, mm. really sucks. Um, yeah, broken, breaking any kind of any kind of bones. Yeah, really yeah. blows. But uh, I had to get surgery on my hand, and so I'm always uh, I'm always at a state of the pain is always at like a six or higher. Mm. And mm. on mm. good days, uh, it stays at a six. Wow. But um, I'm also one of the uh, one of the lucky individuals that opioids don't work on me like at all. And when I was in the Marine Corps, that's all they would do is just throw nothing but Percocet, Oxycontin, Vicodin. They even had me on this uh, really insane um, opioid. It was called Labrufenol. Hmm. And I ended up um, looking that up, and it turns out that the uh, Germans actually used it during World War II to give it to their SS troops wow. because it was such an effective payment medicine. Mm. But it's so it's so deadly, it's so dangerous. My uh, my pain management doctor over in La Jolla, he was saying, well, you know, it's, uh, some service members they'll they'll wash like a Percocet down with a beer or something like that. And he said, well, this you you can't. Okay. Because if, he said if you take the and it's just like a two little milligram pill. He mm. said if you take this pill, then you forget later on, and you end up having a long neck, you know, a regular twelve ounce beer. He said death is imminent. Wow. And I was like, oops. Holy crap. And he said, if your kids get a hold of this and they take it, death is imminent. And uh, the, the opioid was so, was so dangerous that whenever they gave it to me, it was in a prescription bottle that had a, it had a combination lock on the very top of it. And so I would always keep my payments inside my, uh, my day pack. And anytime I would go home, my day pack would go inside of my trunk to ensure that you know, my kids don't get into it. But, uh, so trying to deal with the pain has been a really, a really massive challenge. It's something I got to deal with every day. I'm going through physical therapy, which is horrifying. Um, oh, just, uh, it, damn, getting cotton out just thinking about it. It was, uh, it's one thing that I, that I have to do so I can have a better range of motion. It's not doing anything for the pain, mm-hmm, but mm-hmm, if I can, mm-hmm. you know, if my pain levels is a six with my arm being at my side, and whether I reach up to grab something, if it's still a six, and hey, I consider that an absolute win. Mm-hmm. But uh, trying to figure out like different combinations. So okay, well, will acupuncture work? Uh, yeah. Trying to meditate, and hell, I've even been um, been resorting to using bee stings, catching actual bees. Wow. And um, my doctor over here at Padre Island, he was suggesting that, and he, a lot of people who have MS or muscular dystrophy or like severe arthritis, they actually get the bee venom and it's called bee venom therapy and they get it and they uh, apply the bee stings in whichever areas. And it's supposed to, uh, I guess, uh, eat up the inflammation or anything. So what what I got to do is, um, I get a a pen and I mark with a little circle on my arm where it hurts the most that day. And then me and my dad go out in his backyard and we try to harvest bees and, you know, we catch them with their wings and he'll get it with with some pliers and he'll, apply it to the area that it sting me and, you know, just let it do its thing. But does it suck? Oh my God. Yeah. Mm. It, it, bur- it burns like hell. So I'm like, great. My arm hurts. And I have like three freaking bee stings on my arm. Wow. But if, if it gets me to a point where I'll be, I'll have a better quality of life, then, you know, it's, it's, it's worth it. Wow. Cause in the end, my kids are worth it. Okay. 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 So, I mean, uh, Bee sting therapy, uh, increase in the range of motion, not necessarily, you know, it's not necessarily de- helping with the pain, but it, you know, you're, it's, and then, um, 
obviously you've there's different types of medication that you've tried uh, that you that have that, that have been involved with. So it sounds like you're on a process of finding what's working and what's not working. And it sounds like oh, yeah, it sounds like you're treating that as your new job essentially. If yeah, that's yeah, I guess you could say that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now it seems now, and obviously you know your, your kids and your family is very important to you. Uh, before mm-hmm. the before you started a family, before you had kids, were you the same way? Were you did you have that same type of dedication? I mean, I know that you joined the Marine Corps at a very young age. I know that you were a machine gunner. Mm-hmm. I know that you've mm-hmm. been involved in combat tours, um, and some very uh, graphic events. Um, what got you through those times before the, before the, you know, before the kids and before that, I mean, what, what got you through those times? Um, a lot of it was, um, um, so I lost, uh, I lost two, two Marines in, um, OAF2 and I was attached with the uh, first battalion, 23rd Marines. And, um, actually that's what, uh, that's what this necklace is. It's, uh, these are 7.62 tracers. And uh, this one stands for uh, Matthew Holloway, and the other one is for Juan Rodriguez Velasco. And those are the two Marines that we lost January 13th of uh, 2000, 2005. And uh, before I had I had the kids, one thing that I always try to do is uh, try to live my life as best as I can in honor of them. Wow. They're not able to accomplish their their dreams, their, uh, their goals. Um, like... Uh, Rodriguez Velasco, all he wanted to do in Iraq was to um, was to be able to buy um, buy a home for his mom and dad, and that's just the kind of character that I, this Marine wants. And um, so I try to I try to honor them by trying to live the, the absolute best life that I can, as I could. Uh, for for the longest time, um, it was really eating me up inside, uh, especially the way they were lost with the with an ID explosion. And so that was, uh, that was really, it was really rough, but, um, you know, I just had to tell myself, you know, pretty much, you know, get over yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, wow. If they're in heaven right now, uh, you know, which they are, would they, would they be happy with how I'm living my life or would they be pretty pissed off because I'm doing this? What was me shit? Wow. And that's just one thing I, I had to learn is, okay, no, I got to live the best life I can in honor of them wow. in their memory. Wow. Thank you for sharing that with, with us, brother. I that, appreciate it. That's definitely, uh, that's definitely something that a lot of, a lot of vets share. They share that same type of, uh, experience maybe that, that really kind of, kind of, you know, kind of hit them deep down. And it sounds like you've kind of worked, managed to work through it. Um, which is once again, it's a testament to your character. It's a testament to to your fortitude, man. And the fact that you're sharing that is just so big. Uh, what advice do you have for somebody that's dealt with, that's been through a painful experience like that? That that can't they can't shift from that victim mentality. They can't seem to kind of look at it at the different angle. I mean, what advice would you have for that marine or that sailor or that service member or just that human being in general? I mean. What would you? It's that. Um, it's that. No matter who we are in life, uh, we're we're all gonna be dealt with a hand of tragedy. Now, whether it fits through uh, a combat with it being a a service member or someone who's in the EMS that just you know witnesses horrific tragedy and they came across an accident they had a kid or something with it. Because um, there was this other program that I went through and it was called Mighty Oaks, and it's a it's a Christian base. Um, uh, help a veteran. It's it's made for uh, military members and first responders, and so anyone who's a firefighter, police officer, um, works in the EMS, um, stuff like that, and they're able to attend this. And it's over at the Sky Rose Ranch in uh, in California, like pretty pretty close to where the uh, San Andreas Fault is. And that's probably the the most enriching um, experience that I ever. I've ever gone through in my entire life. I spent years on talking to people with, you know, pieces of paper that are in frames, you know, right behind them and been talking to them for 10 years, trying to get a hold of this, you know, this PTSD monster. And, uh, one thing that my yokes, uh, helped is 
and let us service members know that you know we don't have a monopoly on tragedy. We're not, we can't say, okay, well, you know, I was in the Marine Corps, I, I did a tour, a uh, combat tour in Iraq, so you know, I'm the only one who under, who understands this, and that couldn't be further from the truth. Wow, life is always going to deal a shit sandwich, and everyone has to take a bite. It's just how you how you deal with it. With myself, I I used uh, I used my family and my faith to help get me through it. Wow, and uh, that's one of the one of the really good things I love about Mighty Oaks is it was Christian based, but it also makes you turn and uh, and see the reflection of yourself. And um, and it, it, it's it's not like a you know a lot of programs are uh, they they pander or, or they, they cater to veterans too much to where it's almost like they're uh, they're trying to hold them with delicate gloves. Mm. And it it, it, it it you know it just comes off as all right well. You, you know, they just get they just get rubbed the wrong way, and they're like, "No, I don't, I don't like the stuff handing me out like I'm, you know, broken goods." You know, it's okay. one of those. It's like a poke a vet in the chest thing and say, "All right, well, what are you doing to, you know, make this thing better?" Yeah, yeah. And so it's 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 rough. Uh, a lot of people, you know, you know, uh, they're not Christians or they don't have a faith, and which is perfectly fine. Hmm. But it's trying to trying to look at something okay that's bigger than yourself. Whether it be your family, your parents, uh, something to help out other veterans, or, or, some, or something else like that to get them, keep them, keep them moving instead of keeping them there stagnant to where they feel like they can't reach out to talk to anybody. Wow, wow. So, uh, and what's and can you spell that out for? You said it's M, the name of the no. place. Yeah, it's called uh, Mighty Oaks. Mighty Oaks. Okay, gotcha. Mm -hmm. Mighty Oaks. Okay, so wow. Sounds like that place really helped you out. I mean, it sounds like uh, some th a couple things that you said. Uh, you and I, we don't. I don't have a monopoly on tragedy. You don't have. You know, it's not. You're not the only one. Essentially, right. Um, focusing on something that's bigger than yourself. Um, these are. I think these are things that are. Universe. They sound universal. Like anybody could kind of use that. That type of. Uh, Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you so much for sharing that, brother. I mean, that's, uh, yeah, yeah. Now, can you take us chrono? Now you, how many years did you, did you spend in the military? Uh, close to 17 years. 17 years. Wow. From, uh, 2001 all the way up to 2018. So 2001 up to 2018. Wow. So, I mean, 2001, we're talking uh, early Afghanistan uh, conflict at that point in time. We're talking September 11th, 2001. Were, oh, you, yeah. were you in post or prior to uh, September 11th or was it after? So I, I enlisted, um, I was on the uh, delayed entry program. Okay. And so I, I enlisted uh, September 7th of 2001. Oh, wow. And I had my ship out date of uh, October 15th. And not even, you know, just a few days later, that's when 9-11 happened. Wow. And I had the, had the luxury of going through uh, Marine Corps recruit training a month after 9-11 happened. And you want to talk about the drill instructors being like high paced. Yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah. Oh, damn. That was, that, was a, that was a spicy meatball. Yeah, I could imagine. It was, def it, it was definitely uh, fuel for the fire that lets us know no matter what, it's helped. This was our generation's Pearl Harbor, and so you had everyone just running up to arms. Help. Um, one of the other uh, recruits that I was there with, he was actually a, uh, a, a staff sergeant, and he was an Army Ranger, but he just got out, so he was prior service. But he wanted to go back in and you know take the fight to the enemy, wow. but he wanted to go in as a Marine. Wow. And so um, you know he, he lost the rank of staff sergeant, and so he just started at the very very uh, very bottom of the totem pole and ended up graduating with uh, at the rank of last corporal. Wow. And uh, some of his, uh, not all of his, uh, his chest salad freaking transferred all the way over, mm -hmm. but there were a few that he was able to keep. But it was, uh, yeah, all different walks of life that were saying, no, you know what? You know, my country, my country's calling me and I'm going to answer that call. Wow. Wow. So... How would you describe Marine Corps boot camp for those who aren't familiar familiar with it? I mean, how would you describe that process? Oh, good lord! Or should well, we should we say that for another call? Maybe we should say that for another call. 
Yeah. Because we <laughs> we can do that for another one. Oh, God, I can talk hours about that. Yeah, that was uh, extremely challenging. Probably uh, probably the most challenging thing I've ever done in my entire life. Yeah, gotcha, but gotcha. also the most enriching. Gotcha, gotcha. So, obviously, that had a big impact on you at that time. I mean, how how would it not? And just and the icing on the cake is that it was right after September 11th, like you said, was our generation's Pearl Harbor, which mm-hmm. obviously they took the training probably to another level at that point in time, obviously. Oh, yeah. I mean, because I was in during the same time frame. I mean, I went in, you know, I, I went in the debt program 2004, War in Iraq just started in 2003, so same type of mentality. Same type of mentality during that during that time frame, during that generation, um, during that era, rather. Um, so I, I definitely understand that. Now, what made you want to become a machine gunner? Was that a choice that you made? It sure was. So um, my dad was uh, he was in the army, and he actually uh, he helped. Um, test develop and he went before congress to get the m1 a1 abrams tank approved as our main well as our main battle tank wow and so i have a lot of uh, a lot of military history you know in our family my uh my grandfather was uh was a grunt that was in wow. uh, the battle of the bulge i just recently learned that like uh, a year and a half ago which really my freaking mom wow oh yeah and um and so my dad you know he was he was a tanker he was working on tanks but i wanted to to make my own legacy uh, you know, not necessarily follow in my father's footsteps because I'd be afraid of, you know, what if I do and I fail? And mm. so I just, I had to take, I had, had to take my own path. And, um, and I wanted to, you know, see the results of, you know, the things that we're able to do. And I couldn't see any job that was better than being a, being an infantryman. And uh, uh, they put me as a machine gunner. And when we when we were in Iraq, um, during the January time frame, uh, this is when we were, you know, uh, setting up voting booths so people in Iraq could vote for the very first time. And um, if you go back and you look at old uh, history magazines, where it'll show them they have like a blue, um, a blue mark on their finger showing that they that they uh, that they voted. And it's insane on how only twenty percent of the population here in the United States votes. And mm. for them, these guys were coming in droves. And the place that we set up the voting area was in the city of uh, El Hakwania. And that was a that was a place that was really, really pop- popular for uh, VBIEDs, which are vehicle-borne uh, IEDs. And mm-hmm. so they actually had uh, one entrance, and they had an M1 tank that was right behind the this one berm that we had. So they had orders if any car comes around to the side at high speed, they just, you got the big berserker right there that will just completely annihilate it. And um, seeing the tanks roll around, it was actually a really comforting feeling because it, it kind of felt like my dad was right there with me. Mm. And like even in the midst of uh, everything that was going on, I could look and see that tank, and I was just thinking in my head, "Dad's here. Dad's with me." Wow. Wow. So generations of service prior to you—that's kind of what got you interested in it, obviously, and then. When you mm-hmm. were you were in, you felt it kind of a you kind kind of felt like a um, well even before you went in, you wanted to kind of uh, kind of follow in footsteps, but kind of set your own path with those footsteps. Kind of sounds like right. Wow, wow, and it's and obviously you did that. Mm-hmm. Obviously you did that. Um, I I know you don't have a camera. I know you don't have a stand. I know your arms probably getting tired from holding that phone up. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. It's. This thing's gonna hurt no matter what. So the way I look at it is, uh, my my arm, my pain is my body's just an employee. You know, I'm the, I'm the boss, and so if it doesn't like it, it can go on the internet and complain about it. <laughs> but it just my body works for me, not the other way around. Hell yeah! See, man, I love that attitude, man. I love that uh, that spirit, man. The esprit de corps, you know. It never, never, never gets old. Well, I mean, you know, you shared so much, brother. I mean, I, I, I mean, we. It's only been. Uh, 25 minutes, but the the value that you kind of share with us, getting kind of giving us an insight to um, your current status and you know your service and just the fact that we're catching up, man. We haven't caught up in so long, and you know we're using this time of restriction and um, whatever you call it to uh, to do these things. I mean, is there anything? I mean, we could definitely do a part two. Would you Would you want to do that sometime? 
Yeah, sure. Before we wrap part one up, is there anything else that we should discuss or anything else that you want to share with the viewer that's out there? No, just, um, you know, I'm uh, proud of all the service that I've done, even though, uh, you know, my life has had its, has its tragedies, uh, ups and downs. And my brother broke his neck when he was uh, at the age of 20 and he was in the Marines and he had to learn, uh, pretty much learn how to walk, uh, like, like a, like a being a baby at the age of 20 okay. where, you know, you think you're at the very tippy top of, uh, like, you know, your physical peak performance. The guy was, he would do, uh, marathons and triathlons. And wow. The guy was like freaking modern day Spartan. Dude. He was just, he loves that kind of shit. Wow. And then he was, he, you know, he got in his accident in 1991 and he had to learn how to do everything all the way from the very beginning, but like, oh, learning geez. how to eat, brush his teeth. And he was a really big artist, and he was uh, he was my inspiration for joining the Marine Corps. Okay, okay, I and didn't know so, that. Um, and so, kind of see, seeing all of that, and he was able to bounce back from that. I'm like, yeah, what, what excuse do I have? Okay. And so, you know, tragedy is going to hit everybody. It just depends on how many times you get back up. Wow. And no matter how many times I get hit with, uh, you know, this massive debilitating pain that I have on my on my arm, my freaking leg. Uh, I got right elongable neuralgia from my, uh, from the, uh, the testicular cancer thing. And it feels like you, know, you get hit in the nuts with a wiffle ball bat. And so a lot of times it's it walking yeah. around, you know, sucks, but, um, I don't let my tragedy define, define who I am or stop me whatsoever. And especially with my kids, I don't have the luxury of doing that. I'm a dad. I gotta, I gotta take care of my little, my little Vikings. Wow. Hey, we'll keep charging on, brother. I mean, I didn't know that about your brother. I didn't know that he was in. So he was in 10 years prior to you. That's when he had oh, his yeah, accident. Sure was. Wow. Wow. Okay. So that's even more depth to, to your story than I was aware of. Um, mm -hmm. And he's, uh, he's currently serving right now. He switched over from the Marines and then went into, uh, went into the Army. Which my dad was happy about because my dad's a uh, my dad's an army dog. He was a sergeant major and actually taught at the sergeant major's academy in uh, in Fort Bliss, Texas. Wow! And so we always had a uh, you know a really big pillar of strength um, to know no matter what we're you know, we're going to be all right. We're going to be good. Mm -hmm. And so he raised us with that type of mentality and you know never never being the victim no matter what. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's pretty incredible, brother. So, I mean, we haven't really, we kind of scratched the surface on your service, obviously. Did we want to go, you know, did we want to go through the rest of that and kind of sum that up, or do we want to save that for part two? Oh, we can always save that for part two. Well, thank plus, you. So I, think the, I think the beer in the back is starting to kick warm. <laughs> I appreciate you so much for joining me, brother. I mean, I, you know, I, I uh, every time I, every time I catch up with you, it's 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 a good feeling, and uh, there's so many takeaways that I've got from you. Oh, you know, during that short amount of time that we served together, man, and uh, we should probably get into that uh, on part two, man. So we'll definitely uh, we'll get we'll jump on a call soon, man. All right, appreciate it. Thank you. How's the? Uh, I mean, just real quick. I mean, if you could paint a picture for everybody, you're in Texas right now. What's the current situation currently with the COVID and all that stuff going on? Oh my God. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely, it's insane. It's insane. It really is. Um, it's, it's like a ghost town, man. Um, the malls have shut, have shut down. I'm over here in, uh, in Corpus Christi, Texas. Mm -hmm. And you drive around at night. It's almost like you're driving around like at three o'clock in the morning, but it's only like eight o'clock at night. Um, wow. you know, it's, it's, you know, this virus is taking a lot of lives, which is extremely tragic. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's good that, you know, people are starting to wash their hands because, you know, people were disgusting to begin with anyway. That should have been a habit right off the bat. But yeah, it's, it's really, it's, it's eerie, man. It's something completely different. It's actually, it's absolutely going to be a culture change. You know, people staying six feet away from each other, people walking around wearing masks and shit. And mm -hmm. It, it, it blows my mind because I was at HEB, which is a grocery store chain here in Corpus Christi, where these, these freaks, they, they got masks on the face and gloves and everything. But they have, you know, the mask is like, instead of it covering their entire face like it's supposed to, 
their nose is sticking out. I'm like, oh, so yeah, how's that a thing? And they're walking around, and even though they think they have gloves on, they're like, okay, I'm immune from everything. And what are they doing? They're still walking around, touching, picking up things, touching their face, scratching their face. I'm like, yeah, you're you're defeating the whole process of, or the whole purpose of that. Sounds like they can, like, I, yeah. I, yeah, I saw one lady. She took her mask down, mm-hmm. and she was picking up, getting like a, a bag, and she licked her finger to, you know, get, gri- get a grip on the bag and put the mask back up. I'm over there looking like, <sighs> it's... Like, okay, well, that just, like, defeats the purpose of that whole thing, but, you know, huh, whatever. Sounds to me like they could use some Seaburn training. Oh, I think we lost them. Well, we'll definitely have a part two. That was Stephen Gomez, USMC retired, personal friend of mine, uh, all-around good guy. Oh, he's back! Oh, there we go. You're back. Yeah, sorry, uh, sorry, just got a, just got a call. But, yeah, man, I think we should totally do uh, do a part two. Oh, sounds good to me. Sounds like that lady could have used some seaburn training. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, my gas chambers will absolutely clear her nasal cavity. That's for damn sure. We ain't, man, we even, I mean, we haven't even scratched the surface. I mean, you're a machine gunner turn seaburn. Not, I, I, there's, they should create a new MOS just for you because you were like a seaburn enthusiast freak of nature like i've never seen anybody so excited about getting g- g- creating a gas environment for people to uh suffocate in and yourself oh, as yeah. well <laughs> like like who like what type of human oh, being burned. enjoys that as much as you do i mean I, who does that it like, burns I, so good i love it <laughs> can't wait to catch up with you again brother thank you so much for joining me on the joe mac podcast obviously Right. Yes, Thank sir. you, brother. It was outstanding being a freaking interviewer or to be interviewed. We'll do it again soon, brother. All right. You take care. Thank you so much again.